here up in here. Yes, I am black. If you were not entirely sure, that is the beauty of our culture and race. We come in all shapes and sizes. and hair textures, right? Lots of options out there, brothers and sisters. No need to stray. I can see that because I've been married to the same sister for 44 years. People ask me all the time, Dr. Fraser, what is the key to staying married to the same sister for 44 years? It's a simple word, amnesia. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Fraser's gonna do some dumb shit every now and then. <laughs> or Gene Fraser has done some dumb shit too. We talk about it. We ebb and flow. We bless it and release it, and we move on and raise our children and contribute to our people and our community. I want to thank Koya for vision and courage to bring together four master teachers. This is one for the ages, I'm telling you. This has never been done. I don't know where it's been done. 150 times a year, over 2,000 students around the country. This is this combination that you're about to see has never been on the same stage. Yeah. Yeah. I am proud to share this podium with three race men. I am a race man. What does that mean? What is a race man or a race woman? A race man is a brother or sister that has committed his time, talent, and treasure in the investment and the upliftment of his own people first. And I'm a big gangster about it. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I know you think I was born and raised in Cleveland. I've been living in Cleveland for 50 years, born and raised in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn, New York. Bed-Stuy. 1945, the home of Biggie Smalls, Chris Rock, Jay-Z, Spike Lee, and Al Capone. A lot of people don't know Al Capone's from Brooklyn. So if you're from Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn, New York, you're either a club or a gangster. I'm a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cabo, who's sitting backstage, he's a gangster. David, a gangster. Tariq, who will follow me, is a gangster. And you need to be gangster, too. We're going to talk about it. You need to be gangster, too. Why are we where we are as black people in the 21st century? If Dr. King were to come back here 50 years after his death, he would pimp slap black people. <laughs> We are at the bottom of every single statistic that matters in America. But there are lots of institutional and structural reasons for it. Tariq Nasheed has put together Hidden Colors 4. Awesome. Every black person in America needs to see Hidden Colors 4. Kaaba has invested his life in teaching and instructing professorial way, the reasons why we are where we are. David, what is it, the God box? Hit the God box. That's a revolutionary rap CD. Unbelievable. Understands, but he speaks in a powerful and, a, and positive way on why we must be who God has created us to be. We are African people. Genesis says that God created man in his own image. 100,000 years ago, 
The first human remains of humans as we know them were found in the Olduvai Gorge in Ethiopia. If you're hanging out in Ethiopia, you're blue black. <laughs> so if God created man in his own image, and the first man that God created, the first woman that God created was blue black, what color is God? We are an awesome and powerful people. Except too many of us do not understand this. And it, it has infected our self-confidence. But we are magnificent people. We are the children of the slaves that would not die. We have the genetic encoding of the great kings and queens of Africa. We were building pyramids and solving complex engineering problems when other cultures are living in huts eating each other. <laughs> the caveman. Okay. The beast. The savage. Everything happens for a reason. It serves us in some special way. And you will never understand that reason looking forward. And you will only understand it looking backwards. In spite of the fact that America kept its foot on our throat for 350 years, we still rose like the phoenix. Mm. So if everything happens for a reason, think about this deeply. Maybe we were not brought here, brothers and sisters. Maybe we were sent here. Do you believe that God would put his weakest people here to do his toughest job? I don't think so. How could an America who could morally, spiritually, and biblically justify the kidnapping, raping, and pillaging of another two people, natives already in America, and Africans brought to America, have any moral or spiritual grounding? And perhaps had God not sent black people here, America might have self-destructed by mm. We are an awesome and powerful people. All right, man. The work that must be done must be done by us. So let me say that differently. <coughs> White folks ain't saving black people. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been 400 years and we ain't saved. <laughs> let me say that differently. White people are not even thinking about black people. Do you know what white people are thinking about? They are thinking about white people. They're thinking about their children, their schools, their neighborhoods, their businesses. That's what they're thinking about. I had a good white friend who said to me not long ago, he said, Dr. Fraser, I know what the problem with black people is. I said, oh, really, Bob? What's the problem with black people? <laughs> he said, you spend all your time thinking about us, and we don't spend any of our time thinking about you. Oh, Therefore, if we ain't thinking about you, and you, and, 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 and you, you damn sure ain't thinking about you. Who's thinking about you? Well, well I have to do a Holy Ghost thing. Mm -hmm. I have to go to mm -hmm. So we have two paths that we must go down. Okay. We must be led. And the job of a leader is to define reality and provide hope. So tonight we're going to define reality for you and provide you hope. Dr. Frances Cress Welsing, before she left us in January. Said it. Real plan. We wonder why we're not making progress. This is Dr. Frances Cress Welsing. I'm quoting her. Well, I can't call myself a bitch, a hoe, a nigger, a gangster, and a thug every day and then get up and do something constructive. That's impossible. <laughs> the sister. Kendrick Lamar said it a little bit differently. Revolutionary rapper, positive rapper. Kendrick Lamar said, how can you fight for love on behalf of your people when you can barely find a reason to love yourself? Mm -hmm. Drake said it a little bit differently. Drake said, start on at the bottom, now I'm here. <laughs> I said, amen. Church. Born and raised on the streets of Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn, New York, one of 11 children, mm. eight boys and three girls. My father came to this country in the early 1900s from Guyana, married a beautiful, fair-skinned sister, Ida Mae Baldwin, from Lumpkin, Georgia, and they had 11 children. He was a New York City cab driver because he couldn't get a good education and get a good job in, in, when, he, when he came to America. So he was obligated to drive in a New York City cab. 
At three years old, my mother became mentally ill. And dad had to work 12 to 14 hours a day. He couldn't take care of 11 children. So at three years old, I was orphaned. All of us, we were orphaned. I was three. Stayed in an orphanage from three to five. And because nobody would take 11 children, we were then broken up into threes, and I spent the balance of my life growing up in toxic foster homes on the mean streets of Brooklyn, New York. I went to a vocational high school because nobody thought I was college material. I got a high school diploma in woodworking. Let's be a carpenter. My first job in New York, because I couldn't get into the Carpenters Union, was mopping floors on the midnight shift at LaGuardia Airport. I didn't believe what they told me. So I mopped floors, paid my way through some college. And when it was all said and done, because I only got 25 minutes, when it was all said and done, I ended up with three doctorate degrees. Just inducted into the Minority Business Hall of Fame. And that was what they told me. But fortunately, I grew up in a time when Malcolm was in one ear and Dr. King in the other ear, and Smokey Robinson was writing the lyrics for my music mm. instead of Little Wayne. Have you ever compared the lyrics of Little Wayne to Smokey Robinson? <laughs> <laughs> there is no comparison. Gil Scott Heron, the late Gil Scott Heron. The brother. Dr. Okay. Right. Carmichael, for the first time in the history of black people in the world, put the word power and black together. Okay, That's hey, Kwame Toure. James Brown wrote the iconic tune, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. We were wearing afros and dashikis. Uh, even I was trying to wear afro. <laughs> I'll tell you how stupid that is. <laughs> Whatever. It was a different time. There was a consciousness among our people. We must get back to this consciousness. Now, I, I know that we are speaking to the choir here tonight. You are here because you are conscious. Mm. But there is much work that we must do in raising the consciousness level for the majority of our people. Because all that a person achieves and all that they fail to achieve is a result of their thoughts. And sooner or later, you're going to act out what you really think. Mm. And at the end of the day, whatever we create in our consciousness, we will experience in our own life. For the last 15 years, we've been putting on a big conference called the Power Networking Conference. And at this conference, we teach the five new consciousness, consciousness that black people must take on in the 21st century if we are to fully maximize our human potential as African people leading not only Cleveland, but the world. The first consciousness. We as a people must have a narrower cultural vision. And we must focus on making black people great first. Not America, not Cleveland, not Ohio, but black people great first. We must circle the wagons, all hands on deck, focus on personal growth and development, lifelong learning, and constant effort and improvement. We must shed ourselves of some very badass habits that we have. We have some badass habits as black people. Oh, let me just deal with one of them because we are limited in time. Now, this is a habit that only black people have. Nobody in the world has this habit but us. It is unique to African Americans. Last year, the A.C. Nielsen Company did a major survey on television viewership in America. And what they found is that black people watch 72 hours of television a week. 40% more television than any human ever created. Damn. That's 10 hours of television a day. Any Negro watching 10 hours of television a day needs their ass kicked. <laughs> Shut! Need your ass beat. You eight and you sleep in the rest. You ain't about nothing. 
day. And when you are consuming 10 hours of television a day, you are consuming about 1,200 commercials that is turning you into a consumption machine. See, we are America's consumption class. Jews are America's merchant class. We must shift from being a consumption class, which means buying shit, <laughs> all day, all the time, because we're looking at television, and that's all television is designed to do, is to sell you shit. Tell lies to your vision. So we must shift from being a consumption class of people to a merchant class of people. We'll put a pin in that. So we need a narrower cultural vision as black people as we march into the 21st century. The second consciousness is a tough one. We don't even have it in our value system, but we must. We must socially isolate and ostracize those black people of means that do not give back to their own people. You see, if you are a Jew, if you are a Jew of means, and you do not give back to Jewish people, Jewish causes, Jewish institutions, you are out. You can't even come to the synagogue. Hey, don't come up in here. You are socially isolated and ostracized. Mm. But not in black America, no. You can make millions, not billions. Do nothing for your own people. This is how a Dr. Dre to sign a $2 billion contract with Apple, write a $40 million check with his partner, to USC. and give it to USC, the fifth richest endowed university in America. He didn't go to USC. And not give one penny to a historically black college, which struggles. And if Dr. Dre were here tonight, you wouldn't be able to get, not only in the auditorium, you wouldn't be able to get on the block. <laughs> we must socially isolate and ostracize those brothers and sisters who are not reaching down and lifting up and reaching back and pulling forward. Mm. Third, we must coalesce around our vision and not just our pain. Somebody puts a bullet in the head of one of our children Thousands of us will march, and as we should, for social justice. But boycotting companies that do not support those things that are important to us, recycling our dollars, we can hardly get anybody ever to show up when we talk about it. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. So I think we have the equation wrong. Right now, at this moment in time, because we're loving, giving, serving people, 80% of our time, talent, and treasure is spent on social justice issues. Very important. And 20% on economic development, wealth creation, closing the income and wealth gap between blacks and whites in America. So let me say this differently. When we finish pontificating ad nauseum about our issues, brothers and sisters, <laughs> somebody's got to write a check. Church. Our Jewish brothers and sisters can write a check. Our Asian brothers and sisters write a check. We cannot write a check. Mm. So we have to change the equation. Yes, we must fight for social justice. That needs to be 30% of our time, talent, and treasure, and 10% on personal growth and development, lifelong learning, and constant and never-ending improvement, and 60% on economic development, financial literacy, wealth creation, <laughs> and developing working jobs for our people. We must coalesce around our vision and not just our pain. Mm. Number three, we must connect the dots. I've been talking about this for 30 years. I've written six books on this. We must leverage our collective resources and intellectual capital. We are a $1.1 trillion annual economy. If we were a nation, we'd be the 16th nation in the entire world. <coughs> if you look at the intellectual capital, the brain power of just one generation, the baby boomer generation, my generation, mm. We have 500 billion hours of formal education and professional training. If you wanted to put a dollar value on that, at just 10 bucks an hour, try to get an education and professional training for 10 bucks an hour, that would mean that our collective intellectual capital uh, base from one generation alone is worth in excess of $5 trillion. So we must coalesce 
connect the dots, leverage more effectively our collective resources and intellectual capital. God has given us everything we need to succeed. Let me say it again. We have everything we need to succeed except each other. Jews have each other. East Indians have each other. Asians have each other. Arabs have each other. We don't have each other. Now, the minute we learn how to do this, and no one is interested in us learning how to do this, the minute we learn how to connect the dots, we will demonstrate to ourselves and to the world that we are a force to be reckoned with. Mm. We are an awesome and powerful people, but we must connect. It is easy to break a finger. It is hard to break a fist. The strength is not in the wolf, the strength is in the pack. Finally on this, we must think entrepreneurially. We must create work and jobs for our people. And one of the things that we've been working on for 30 years, next year we will celebrate the 30th anniversary of Brazenet at our conference in Washington, D.C., mm. July the 6th through the 8th of next year. We must learn how to brand, we must learn marketing, we must learn packaging, we must learn how to start and to build businesses. Are we moving in the right direction? Absolutely. There are 1.2 million black-owned businesses according to the latest studies by the U.S. Census Bureau. About 133,000 of those businesses, 133,000 of those businesses are earning more than a million dollars a year and are employing black people. So one of the number one goals for our people is to create work and jobs for our people, to think entrepreneurially, that we too must create work and jobs for our people. Why? Because that is the only way to raise up the poor. We ultimately must become the number one employer of our own people. Yeah. Jews are the number one employer of their own people. Asians are the number one employer of their own people. Arabs are the number one employer of their own people. East Indians are the number one employer of their own people. We must go down that path. Koya, I'm seeing the lights go in and out. That means I'm out of time. Doesn't it? <laughs> I'm out of time. All right, I'm, I'm going to close. We knew that this would be hard to get everything in in 25 minutes. And so I'm going to close with one final thought, if you will allow me, Koya. And it is a quote from my favorite African-centered philosopher, John Henry Clark. Yeah! And John Henry Clark consisted by people many years ago before he died. What a people do for themselves depends upon what they think about themselves. Mm. It is important, brothers and sisters, that we think and believe that we are an awesome and powerful people. No it is important to think and believe that if we were once great, that we will be great again. That the Bible tells us that the first shall be last, but the last shall be first. It is important for us to think and believe that we are an awesome people and that God can use us in spite of our mistakes, in spite of our picadillos, in spite of our weaknesses. God uses imperfect people. Understand that. God uses imperfect people to do his work. And the next time you feel that God can't use you because you've messed some stuff up, you've screwed some stuff up, that you're not quite there yet, the next time you believe that God can't use you, I want you to remember the following. I want you to remember that Noah was a drunk. That Abraham was too old. That Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rehob was a prostitute. Hey. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. All David the Holy had Scripture. an affair and was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Hey. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer. And Lazarus was dead. Mm. Woo! All of your holy scripture. Don't ever give up. That's my story. Shut!